Um, thank you once again for your speech. And now uh, we have a panel debate uh, between Mr. Luca and uh, Mr. Uh, Bruckner. And um, the title of this debate is Reasons and Consequences, sorry, <laughs> consequences uh, for Leaving uh, the EU. But I uh, would start, uh, I think, like general and start in the general uh, topic, we will a little bit, we will elaborate on the United States of Europe a little bit more and then we um, switch to current situation in Europe, I would say. So please welcome on stage. Um, yes, so um, referring to uh, your speech, uh, Mr. Luca. Um, well, it, it was really interesting. So I would ask you a question, or that's a question for both of you. Uh, the level of current uh, European integration is just, as according to some of opinions, um, what do you think currently Europe has achieved? Uh, what, a, like, let's say, current position of Europe in the way of integration? Is it, you know, um, can we say right now that um, Europe was successful in integration process or it's still there are some steps to take and which direction um, this process uh, will go uh, eventually? So um, just maybe your opinion. If I, is this on? Oh. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, now? Yes, better, no, better, no. better. Okay, yes, maybe yes. I should just get a little closer. <coughs> so maybe as some sort of a um, combination of answering your question and giving a response to the keynote speech. Yes. Um, coming from academia, as we both come, and you come with sort of a double head as being a politician and a professor on leave at the moment. There is something important methodological to keep in mind. If we get a question like, do we need the United States of Europe or is it a good thing or not? So in academia, we reduce the complexity of the world by defining a research design and then everything that is within the research design can get a straightforward answer. And you presented a variety of different lenses to look at the subject, in this case, the United States of Europe. And then depending on what kind of lenses we look through, we see something clearer. So the Marxist looks through their lens. The ones who believe in optimum currency areas look through their lens. And everyone can come up with one thing. If a politician or the ones who are responsible for the integration project as such would do the same, they would always come up with reasons not to do anything because the complexity of the world we live in is way bigger than the stylized reality. It's like drawing a map. If you want to come all the way from the city to Tegel to sit here, then you use a map which is not the world as such, but it stylizes everything you need to know to go from A to B. So the map doesn't inform you about Schienenersatzverkehr or a flooded street or whatever, so you don't necessarily go from A to B because it reduces the complexity to everything you need to know for this particular purpose. What do I need to know to go from A to B? So all of these different models are right within the framework of what they try to explain. Well, if we are in the position of being in an integration project like the European Union, being confronted with internal developments and external developments, it doesn't help us much to just claim that there is no demos. And then we go home and say, well, if there's no demos, then we cannot, we cannot ever have a democratic union. Because at the end of the day, all the decisions that are taken within the range of what you called the optimum level of integration or beyond needs to be legitimate. 
and if the procedure is perfectly democratic or not according to whatever model of democracy. And we have an institution called the Federal Agency for Civic Education to educate the citizen to be prepared for an active role in a Western-type democracy. They sometimes print volumes like this with democracy theory, and only one of them uses this ultimate definition of either there's a demos or not. And we both come from a country that didn't start with the perfect citizen when Germany became a nation state. It was a patchwork of different cities and regions and kingdoms and whatnot that by being formed as the Kaiserreich in the 19th century, then step by step moved into a system that meets the high standard of a Western type democratic system. So my criticism for using these lenses is that A, they don't represent reality because they have to be stylized within the range of their research design, and B, it is statist. It assumes that there is no such thing like a development. And with both of this, it doesn't mean that none of these models don't matter. It helps a great deal to improve the project as such. But as you rightly said in the beginning, I didn't say anything else in my intervention. At the moment, no one is lobbying for the United States of Europe as a fully centralized system, because again, we both come from a country with a fully centralized past, a totalitarian regime in which everything was centralized in the Führer. And instead of imitating the flaws from the previous model, we decentralize power by federalizing Germany, which is the response to what once was fully centralized. So neither the use of the F word, let's federalize and let's find an institutional setting that allows to deal with all the challenges is wrong, nor is an approach of thinking about how legitimate are the different decisions we take, not in a stylized, this is the mother of all democratic models, but in a way that responds to the hybrid nature of the club. And in that sense, I don't really see a problem with fairness. If we violate the one vote, one person mm -hmm. principle, then we do it because it's not only a Western type democratic system in which that would be the ultimate principle, but it's also a club of states for states, which means that we institutionalize a form of minority right protection, which explains why we have double majority with a major majority of states and a majority of citizens. And in the combination of the two, the first one gives priority to the little ones, the, the small member states, and the second one rebalances that Germany is a bigger country and we cannot discriminate the votes of Germany. If Germany has 82 million and Luxembourg or Malta are the size of a district in the city of Berlin, I think that should be enough for a, a first right. intervention. Uh, should I repeat the question or? Um, so yes. Please, All please right. So um, I was addressing your speech and some of opinions that uh, were included there. Uh, they said that the level of integration, the current level of, integra of integration is uh, not sufficient, uh, no, sorry, uh, not, um, we, di we didn't achieve um, appropriate level of integration. So my, my question was uh, if you're s you also support this idea or if, if we, didn't achieve that level, so what should we do, or which steps should we take to in, in order to achieve some uh, certain level of integration? Yes. Um, I, I will answer this question in a minute, and actually I think I have already commented on this in my uh, keynote speech, so, so I can be brief on that. But just a few lines of uh, reply to, to what you have said. You have broadened the scope now more than I actually wanted uh, uh, it to be broad in the sense that I was not talking about the concept of a fully centralized state. I was taking the United States of America as a model, and mm -hmm. the United States of America are not a fully centralized state, but they are a federal state rather than a confederacy of states. How the southern states perceived the Union to be prior to uh, the Civil War in, in, in the United States of, of America. So my model, which I criticized, was actually a model which is still a federal state, but it is a state of its own and not a confederacy of states. 
And I know of no state, no democratic state in the world, which has not a parliament be elected by the principle that all votes are counted equal. Not, not a single one. There are many two-chamber systems where the states in the federal state have their own representation in the second chamber, or Bundesrat, or the American Senate, or something like this, and, and one man, one vote is, is not realized in the second chamber. But in the first chamber, where we have the directly elected representatives of the whole population, all democratic states, as far as I know, have this one man, one vote principle, with the exception of the European Union. And I think this is something which we could not sustain if the European Union were to become a state, a federal state rather than a confederacy. Very clearly, things were much different earlier on because the European Union developed out of treaties where only governments were represented and they were the decision makers. And each government actually had just one vote, regardless of how big the population was which had voted for this, this government. Currently, however, we have a parliament and we have the council. The council is the second chamber in the European Union. The council does not realize the one man, one vote uh, um, principle and the parliament doesn't do it either. So no elected body or no legislative body in the European Union uh, represents this principle and this is what I criticized. Now on your question with the level of integration, as I already said, I think that um, for integration there's always room for improvement. <laughs> And there is also, there are some areas of integration where I think that the European Union went too far, right? As I pointed out, I think the uh, introduction of a common currency was not a good idea. And it has led us in a severe crisis with massive damages in southern European member states uh, in the wake up of the, um, of the financial uh, crisis. Um, the refugee or the, the, the common asylum policy is another area of integration where we have seen that uh, the European Union is not able to handle this issue well. Nobody seems to have a really good solution how we can do it better without sort of going back to national uh, borders, which some people advise uh, to do. But very clearly, the state in which we are in, in terms of asylum and refugee policies, is unconvincing and actually dangerous for the union as a union because our current legislation in the European Union gives the Council of the European Union the right to decide how many refugees should be relocated to which member state. And some of the member states are vehemently opposed to the Council deciding this matter rather than them deciding that on national level which is a conflict which is still, as you know, um, um, unresolved in, in the European Union and which may have, on the long run, similar potential to break up the European Union or to break away member countries from the European Union as the Brexit uh, debate has had. This said, and then I'm, I'm done, there are other areas of integration where we could do more. I'm, I'm, I'm deeply convinced that in terms of environmental policies, there are a number of um, um, transnational environmental problems which we can deal with better at the European Union level than we actually do. For instance, plastic waste is one of the uh, issues which actually we, we currently deal with this to, uh, or we, we start dealing with it. Uh, this is why I mentioned this example. Uh, but there are other trans-border issues, um, energy issues, uh, for instance. There's the capital market union, which is absolutely not uh, realized, where we can increase integration and where it would be very beneficial. But we should be critical enough to say or to, to see that there are also other dimensions in the European Union where integration went farther than it could actually be managed to the benefit of the people. All right. Um, if you want to, do you have any remarks on this? Well, I don't topic? think it helps if whoever claims that we know better what the ideal balance of integration is or should be because at the end of the day all of these forms of distributing steering resources money law information will lead to redistributional effects and if someone is potentially on the loser side then a fully fledged state system would find ways to balance it. 
But given the very nature of the European Union as something which is more than an international organization, but less than a state, the EU is poorly equipped to do this. So by declaring we apply a specific model that is an ideal textbook model, no matter if it's a political, a legal, an economic or an environmental one with externalities, we stylize the complex reality again and don't really have a political response if we are confronted with unintended consequences. And the high quality of the civilized form of dealing with all these problems in the European Union is that we established a system of institutions that deal with this. And sometimes the compromises look not self-explanatory, they take ages, they're intransparent, for some they are unfair. And if one insists on, I have an ideal model and this is different from the ideal, then every compromise is lame compared with the real thing. But this is in its essence the very nature of the European Union that it produces compromises all the time because it doesn't follow this one rationale given the fact that there are many competing rationales in a political discourse. And this is what we discussed before as one of the qualities of European values, that we have this discourse-based model to find compromises and not this one-size-fits-all thing, even if it's theoretically elegant and intellectually pleasing. All right, thank you. Um, so maybe my next question will be, um, so if you're still talking about the model of United States of Europe, uh, and also considering all uh, the problems or issues or policies we mentioned before, do you think that um, in a way to build this model, like just in, in, you know, in theory, if we, if we build, it, this, build this model, so sh what, should, uh, what should Europe change or what kind of policy should be re you know, uh, rebuilt or rethink um, in a way to achieve this model of United States of Europe? So I assume the immigration policy is one of them or um, what do you think would need to be changed? Well, if you ask me, this is not a cooking recipe <laughs> where we add another ingredient and then things will be fine. I would rather continue with what I just pointed out in the institutional process. All right. If we develop in our discourse what we want to address and what we don't want to address, then the demos speaks and who am I to tell the demos what the demos should do? From an academic point of view, I can give some sort of general overviews if you do this, then the cost benefits would be that. If you do something else, then the cost benefits would be something else. But to claim ex ante that I have the superior knowledge <laughs> and these stupid citizens should just follow because I studied and they don't, is a misunderstanding of a number of unintended consequences. Because whatever we do as a, pol uh, a political step will reach, lead to redistributional consequences. And what is fair then is not an objective question. It is a question that lies like beauty in the eye of the beholder. And given the fact that we have such a culture of diversity with so many different small countries, different sensitivities, there is a lot that we simply cannot do from this country just because we are Germany. In a perfect model with equal actors, it wouldn't matter, but we are in some sort of a historical context, in a cultural context, in which it does matter. And so from the perspective of what would you do, given my German bias, I could say something as a citizen, what I would want, but to have a superior blueprint that politicians as slow and stubborn as they are should only understand and then they execute it, would be a form of arrogance that is not what people in academia should present. All right. Well, I'm perhaps not the best person to ask how would you proceed in order to, buy, to, to build the United States of Europe because I don't want to build the United States um, of, of Europe. And I would actually suggest that we just forget this uh, whole concept because it is vague um, anyway uh, and, and rather agree on s let us improve the mm -hmm. European Union. I agree. Right? Yeah. So let us 
discuss what works well in the European Union and which doesn't work well and, and what, right. what can be made better, right? Uh, and this is where I think that I'm not really satisfied with your approach here saying, well, yeah, you cannot look at single building blocks and analyze them sort of stylized mm -hmm. and, and academic and, and something like this, but you always have to take the whole picture and then there's the complexity and you just mm -hmm. have to move mm -hmm. on even though the single building blocks are not solved in a good uh, way. I think we should look at the single problems in the European Union. And we should identify what is the problem, what is our way of solving the problem, and does right. this way of solving the problem work well. And this we can break down area by area, and actually this is, e is exactly what the Commission is doing. Um, I mean, the, the Commission has all the, the, these commissioners and, and all the, the director, uh, director gen gen generates, uh, what was the name of it? Uh, <laughs> um, the, uh, uh, help me please, uh, the next layer in the Commission Administration, um, Directorat General, so I say in French, <laughs> um, and, and they have their responsibilities and, and they look at single problems in, in a very, very narrow breakdown actually and, mm -hmm. and they find to try to find solutions and very often they find good solutions and everybody is satisfied and nobody talks about this. This is perhaps a perception problem about the European Union that everybody always tries to talk about the things which do not work well and not so much about the things which work well. But there's also a tendency in politics to say, well, there's just everything nice and, and working well in the European Union and this is clearly not the case. And so we should you know, just be honest and, and say some fields work well, others do not, and let's improve where things are not working well and sometimes this can mean that we reduce integration there. You know, all, all that, that I have entered politics because I thought the common currency was one step of integration which was going too far. And that we would be in a much better economic situation in the European Union had we abstained from <coughs> introducing the euro. And I think we should have an open debate on that. Right. But to make it an open debate needs to clarify what is our norm if we make normative statements. And if you declare that something works well or something is good, then we have to explain to the people what is the norm that we use to judge this is better than something else. And this is already a choice, because if we look at what is good, it can be economic efficiency or it can be an equality-based model that everyone gets the same, like your equality of voters concept. Mm -hmm. So all of these follow a single rationale to make it rational or to make it good in terms of a normative debate, but it all comes with unintended consequences if you change the rationale. So politicians narrow down the scope to this is the one and only thing. Sometimes they even call it without alternative and then they give birth to an alternative, which sometimes comes in a very ugly form. But this is their role. They compete with other options and in an ideal democratic system, we compete and then the voter votes for me personally, this is better. And then it's a subjective decision. While what we do in academia is to look beyond the model and also apply different rationales and then it might have very complicated political choices as a consequence that economically speaking it's a perfectly elegant model to apply a monetary union in a stylized situation say an optimum currency area as a checklist and only this allows to introduce a common currency but if you think beyond this point and have other reasons but the ones within your model then you might come to a different conclusion and this is much more complicated and complex in a political debate because it's so tempting for populists to reduce the complexity and present things as if, if we would only look at the one thing, then we would know better. And I am the messenger to present to the people that the establishment is doing something wrong. So if you follow me, then we would be better off. And this is something we should avoid because it is the end of a democratic discourse to pretend that we know better if we don't make clear what exactly are the rationales and why we decide that other rationales shouldn't matter. All right. Any remarks? May I? No, no. If I, I would have lots of comments on what you just said. I'm sure you do. <laughs> I mean, as you all know, I've left the party that I founded, the alternative. 
And you now say it uh, sometimes comes in the shape of an ugly alternative. I, I would first like to point out, even though I disagree with the current policy line of the uh, Alternative für Deutschland, it is not the alternative which is ugly. What is ugly, if you use this word, is that it is being voted for, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, if it didn't receive votes, then there's no problem with the alternative. But this alternative, which is currently represented by uh, the, the Alternative for, for Germany, has tremendous support. It is now the third largest party, well, yeah, the third largest party in, in, in Germany. And if you take democracy seriously, and you say the alternative is ugly, then you must say that democracy here is ugly. Because the party just gives the people the possibility of being heard, of expressing their opinion. And I don't really know what is so ugly about that. Actually, I think it would be better no, if you, there, you there got were me, a debate. You, that got that me, you got me wrong. I didn't say, I didn't say the fact that okay. there is an alternative is ugly. I, in a pluralist system, it's the end of pluralism if everyone sings the same song. So it's, right. it's of <laughs> utmost importance that alternatives are presented to the public. So in that sense, it's the lifeline of pluralism and democracy. The way it appeared is ugly. This is what I said. So what they, what they stand for is the exact opposite of what we discussed before as the values of the European Union. It's committed to pluralism, while the alternative presents there's only one way of doing it. It is not pluralist. It is anti-elite in whatever that means, because in the beginning, this was an el elite driven process. It's not that we wait until people march in the streets to build a single market. So someone needed to do something. But it has a number of features that worked well in other countries to dismantle the principles of democracy. And this is what I'm concerned about. Not the simple okay. fact that someone kicks the shins of the establishment. That's what they have to face because if they choose to be politicians then they have to face criticism and not only support us and everyone is happy with people who seem to be larger than life yeah. this would also be the end of democracy but what they currently represent is not only i have a different opinion but they work with other forms in the political debate than looking for truth trying to test the logical contradictions and the empirical facts. The whole play with fake news, crossing red lines, provoking one should be able to say something which is against the political discourse. All these forms of technique manipulate public opinion and this makes it extremely complicated to make the model that we described earlier work, no matter if it's on a European level or within the German system. Well, I, I didn't want to discuss with you the, the alternative uh, for, for Germany in, in uh, detail. There are some things I agree with and others I, I don't, but let's, let's leave this asi aside and go to the uh, search for truth mm -hmm. um, that um, you mentioned. I mean, I would agree that the AFD does not try to look for the truth, but rather it tries to um, bias the uh, view of reality in a negative way on, on many different issues. Mm -hmm. However, and now I come to the topic of populism that you have had raised, indicating the AFD, these are the populists. We have other parties in Germany which always bias the truth to the positive, right? Which never acknowledge the problems, right? Which just create myths also about Europe, for instance. Europe is just good for everybody, everywhere, every time. Something like this, right? which is just not the case. I mean, look at what has happened in Southern Europe, in particular in Southern Italy, in Southern Spain, and in Greece, right? This was a disaster, what, what has been caused by sovereign debt crisis, financial crisis, Euro crisis. And we need to be honest there too. I would say those people which just glorify <coughs> the European Union, um, they are as much populists as those which sort of, you know, criticize it everywhere and, and don't find uh, any positive aspect about it. And sometimes so even repeat the failure of nationalism that they try to overcome. Some realism here, I think, is uh, just important. Some differentiated uh, view of 
reality, some fairness and honesty in, in discussion. This is what I would like mm -hmm. to call for. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm um, sure you, you, you will agree. Yeah, now, yeah, but the norm, we, but last we, part, please, la the, the last part. You mentioned a norm. We, we need to have a norm to find out what is an improvement. How can we make the European Union uh, better? No, I don't this, is, this is not what I said. I Sorry. said, if you make a normative judgment, like something is good, we need to know how you measure good or bad. Oh, that's exactly what, what I meant. Sorry, good. perhaps I didn't express it well. We had such an indicator. Our indicator in the European Union was that all governments of all member states must agree. We had unanimity requirement in the Council. And we have given up this unanimity requirement in the Council in the Lisbon Treaty, as, as, as you know. Now we have qualified majority. It is fairly convincing to say that something is improving if all governments agree. It is not absolutely convincing because the opposition may have different views, but the governments are democratically legitimized. And if all governments of all member states in the European Union agree we do something, then there seems to be a perception that this is an improvement to everybody. With qualified majority rule, we have given up this type of normative judgment. And actually, this has led to Brexit, because suddenly the European Union was making decisions with qualified majority on, say, financial regulation issues following the financial crisis, which were opposed by the United Kingdom. But the United Kingdom did not have the means to stop these legislative measures, because there was qualified majority. Now, the problem was that the center of financial activity in the European Union is in the heart of the United Kingdom in the city of London. So they were saying, well, hey, what are you doing here? You are deciding on legislation by qualified majority without our consent, sometimes, not always, sometimes without our consent, but it affects us. And it affects us in a detrimental way. It is to the detriment, at least to the business of the city of London. This is what Cameron and his people were concerned about. And that is actually, if you trace down the roots of Brexit, and that I think was also a topic of our panel discussion exactly. here, if you trace down the roots of Brexit, then you will see that Cameron's main concern was actually that the United Kingdom would be marginalized in the European Union because the interests of the Eurogroup would always dominate since they have a qualified majority. And the United Kingdom would stay aside. They have an opt-out from the euro. They don't need to introduce the currency. But they would not have a possibility anymore of blocking decisions which are in the interest of the Eurogroup, but not in the interest of the United Kingdom. That was why <coughs> David Cameron tried to carve out a niche for the, uni for the uh, United Kingdom to get something like a red card on decisions the Council would take affecting Great Britain somehow negatively. And he didn't get it. The whole refugee thing was then overlaying the, the decision of the British people. But at the heart of David Cameron's attempt to reform the European Union by threatening an exit referendum was this concern. And therefore, I now think, I have thought about that differently in earlier years, that the Lisbon Treaty in its movement to qualified majority decisions in the Council was actually not a good idea because now we cannot be sure anymore that decisions of the European Union are beneficial to all countries concerned. Well, this is a perfect example of what I try to get across. Because there is one rationale that says sovereign member states should maximize control in important decisions. And if this is the yardstick to measure is it good or is it a bad form of decision making, then you have something with a clear result. While the general trade-off is, and that is also what we discussed in class with intergovernmental and supranational decision-making is, if the EU would just be another international organization and every member could always veto whatever, then we get never anything done. And the moment we lower the threshold, which is the idea of qualified majority voting, then we do get something done. So the one is, I satisfy my people at home by having as maximum control as possible. And if I have a vested interest, like the city of London, then I can try to make sure that nothing is getting out of control or the EU is not moving in the wrong direction. But if I look at the bigger picture that the 
union is not just a single issue organization that is organizing finance, but has many more other policies to balance, then a lower threshold allows the EU to be more effective in terms of getting things done, which can lead to a situation in which you are in a minority position and then you lose, while in other areas the overall result might be positive. But this depends on how you define your national interests, which are also not statist or set in stone. My reading is more that Cameron gambled because he got very much under fire within his party and he gambled wrong. And then in the end, he came up with a number of explanations in which, of course, the city plays a crucial role. But when you look at the percentage of GDP, it's not like live or die but it is just an important sector as maybe renewables become an important sector in Germany or the car industry or what else you would see as an important player to make Germany defined in, in a particular way. Um, thank you that you switched for, for one, from one topic to another even without me <laughs> getting you, it. You don't even need <laughs> a moderator. <laughs> interrupted you so actually i have uh, i think two last questions like um, addressing what you just said so um maybe you can provide me with your opinion on um what kind of influence brexit has on its own sorry of on future of europe and also in following this question as we might know that there are some uh m similar movements such as frexit and deutschleaf and i don't know what else and do you think there is any uh solution how to prevent those movements to to grow or uh so just in general uh in this context can you uh provide me with your opinion its impact on europe and its future Well, um, I, I don't really see that there are strong movements um, asking for any other member state to leave the European Union. So I don't really think that there is an imminent danger of the European Union breaking up with the right. exception of the United Kingdom leaving. This said, um, I also think that Brexit has taught European leaders lessons in the sense that they all know what the true motives for David Cameron were to call this re referendum, namely his concern that he may be outvoted in the council. And my kind of proof, <laughs> it's not really a proof, but at least it's some evidence that I have for this is that the council has been very reluctant to make a uh, majority decision <laughs> on the relocation of refugees after Poland and Hungary and some of the smaller Eastern European member states um, made clear that this would be completely contrary to their political will. So it would be possible to have this decision in the council, relocation of refugees across member states, more than the 120,000 that have been relocated or should have been relocated, um, it would be possible to make this decision in the Council, but the Council has refrained from doing that because the Council has realized that this would put the integrity of the European Union uh, in danger again. And I hope that this lesson is remembered. I agree that qualified majority rule makes many processes much easier and this can sometimes be practical on the minor issues. I also agree that a union which has now 28 member states cannot be as easily managed as a union which had 15 member states, even though I would like to remind <coughs> you that with unanimity <coughs> rule and 15 member sta states, we achieved an awful lot in the European Union. Actually, most of what is a success in the European Union was achieved with unanimity at 15 member states. So I'm not absolutely convinced that unanimity um, blocks progress because there may be measures of integrations which are appealing to everybody and there would be no resistance to them so no single country would block these measures in the council. And these are likely good measures if no country can think of any 
anything bad uh, which would happen to them from this type of uh, measures. So in some way, I think you're on the safer side if you have unanimity rather than qualified majority rule. But I uh, admit um, or uh, I, I realize that you could carefully, cautiously also practice a system with qualified majority if you take into account properly the sensitivities of countries which might be outvoted uh, in, in, in the council. And this, if this is done by our policymakers, then everything is fine. My concern is that in times of crisis, people may not be so sensitive of the concerns of other countries. That was what we saw in the Euro crisis when Merkel and Sarkozy mm -hmm. um, negotiated the fiscal compact without even notifying the United Kingdom about this fact, which was very badly received by uh, Downing Street uh, number 10, that nobody had actually informed them about what was being negotiated and agreed upon between Merkel and, and Sarkozy. And this was a sign of stress in a severe crisis, and I'm worried that such things may occur again in future crises, that the sensitivities of marginal countries are not properly taken into account, and that this may then, in the long run, endanger the integrity of the Union. Now when we speak of qualified majority voting, I don't really follow the interpretation of the Lisbon Treaty as the watershed in how it was decided. In the very first beginning, the European community decided uni unanimously. And then in the Treaty of Rome, it said already after a transition period of eight years, we move to qualified majority vote to get things done, because they learned already from the functioning of international organizations that this is a major threshold that needs to be passed. And even if you have no no rational concern about the content of a policy, you could potentially veto something to get something in return. So the incentive to block is an inbuilt problem to get things done. So they introduced, after eight years of a transition period, a qualified majority as the general principle, and only the empty chair crisis with the Luxembourg Compromise changed something like the reintroduction of a veto that then was based on what kind of policy and what kind of distribution of power is there, was applied or wasn't. While in practice, the council never really voted. They were sitting and discussing until everyone could live with a result. And then they presented in a press conference that everyone could practically be a winner. This was more like a family system with the shadow of potentially we could decide. And only Lisbon returned to what the original idea was, which can be read as it has always been the possibility of a veto. A number of countries have been overruled in this time where you presented this is nothing but unanimous votes, international organization style. I have a slightly different reading, and we can also go through literature in which people look into um, the analysis of council voting, like Wallace and Hayes Renshaw, and a number of other traditional intergovernmental versus supranational analysis that prove this empirically. But when we come back to your question about the implications of Brexit, I think by far the biggest loss is having no British influence in the institutional process of finding a compromise. So Britain voluntarily gives up a say that every candidate country can't wait to get as a fully respected member in which a Montenegrin or a Macedonian or a whatever <coughs> waiting country wants to execute and they have it and give it up and return to a status of a 19th century open clash of conflicting national positions without any form of buffering this with a sophisticated system of institutions. This is by far the highest price, aside from hard Brexit, soft Brexit, establishing a border in the Irish Sea, fixing the relationship with Northern Ireland and Ireland. Like everything we have on the list is painful, it's terrible, it's dumping a number of achievements, but by far the highest cost in my perception is that they don't sit at the table and negotiate mm -hmm. and add what we often 
found difficult as a British perspective and Germany cannot hide behind the Brits anymore as the Dutch ambassador told us on Tuesday if Britain uh, if France comes and say hey can you do this and they say, well sorry I would love to but London isn't coming with us so there is a lot of losing not only a certain spirit that would be good for the European Union because this is also perfectly European no matter if they are surrounded by water or not but it is the open clash of conflicting interests that doesn't use the institutional setting anymore. But I also would like to add something else in a more general perspective because it's in a lot of ways European Union bashing to tell the audience that this is bad because they did too much, this is the monetary union, or this is bad because they do too little, which is the migration policy, which we cannot really describe as perfectly Europeanized as a policy that is analyzed. The problem with it is that it fuels populist debates in which we pick something that is dysfunctional and make it look as if it only needs a national response and then things would be better which is as intellectually lame as shifting everything to a European level and then love, peace and happiness is produced in Brussels and we would all be better off. None of this is true because the situation is different from policy to policy. But the problem that we face right now is that other than in the past when Euroscepticism was about how can we fix the flaws of the architecture of the monetary union in which it was urgently needed to have an optimum currency um, tool to analyze what is missing or to criticize an establishment or to deconstruct the sugar-coated version of it would be so good to have it and the mantle of der Geschichte weht and all these things that ha are unrelated to the, to the monetary union. But instead of allowing populists to just blame the European Union for doing too much or doing too little, we don't even think in such a debate what the quality of results are on a national level. So we could also do something like this and take every single country and look at Hungary and look at Germany and look at France and the performance in which very other forms of rationale water down or pollute the purity of a certain concept that is applied. But the image that is presented by a debate in which we do the blame game, the EU is doing this wrong and that wrong and that wrong is that Euroscepticism is not searching for how can we improve what we have already achieved, but the achievements are presented as if they are the problem. The Euro was wrong, Schengen is wrong, democracy is wrong, shifting competences on a European level is wrong, so let's kick it down the road and do something else instead and start from scratch with Little England or other micro versions of what could be better. I totally agree. I don't see any politician nor a party movement which is not short term benefit oriented to flirt with the idea of a Chexit, of a Frexit, of whatever, because everyone who understands the basics of the system would know how prohibitively expensive the idea already, the launch of a possibility of following Brexit would be economically, not to speak of the cultural implications and mass migration or FDI redirections and whatnot. So this is more like pleasing people who have emotional problems with identifying with Europe. But I think the, the imbalance with on a national level, things are fine and we don't need to discuss it. On a European level, everything is crap because it's a construction site and never as good as the real thing leads to an impression of it's not worth fighting for. And I think it's one of the greatest achievements of civilization that we managed to pool our resources, especially in times of globalization, when there are only two types of states, small states and those who haven't realized that they are small. I, I agree to everything to what you have said about the British uh, influence in um, European affairs and how deplorable <coughs> it is that we won't have it um, anymore. I just want to comment on your remarks about what you always call populists. As I say, I, I think everybody is populist in politics, <laughs> in particular the big parties, others as much as others. Um, 
because I, I think what is important, which I did not really find in your words, is uh, we must have the intellectual um, honesty to carefully look at the European Union and try to identify where the European Union does not work well. And where it doesn't work well, almost necessarily this implies that the European Union has some competences which it assumed and which it didn't make good use of. And then we have to discuss uh, what is the alternative um, for sure. that. So, yeah, well, I mean, from, from your words, I sort of heard these other populists which say, well, let's remove it and let's start from <laughs> scratch. That's actually not what is being said. Mostly what is said is here's a problem. And we must change something. And we cannot just say there isn't any alternative. There are always uh, alternatives. And we need to discuss these uh, alternatives without being relegated to, you know, the corner of those you never talk to because the, you find them ugly. There are legitimate questions being asked about uh, policy areas of the European Union, whether they have served the European peoples or whether they have not. And as you all know, my particular interest is uh, the euro, the, the common curr currency. It is quite striking, if you look at data, that the European Union was very successful in closing income gaps in the first 40 years of its existence. I mean, income gaps between countries. Quite generally, poorer countries which belong to the European Union or the European Community or the European Economic Community had faster economic growth up to 1990 than the richer countries in the European Union had. So income gaps were closing. And this is something which promotes peace, obviously, because distributional struggles are less, less likely. Since the introduction of the euro, this has reverted within the eurozone. It has not reverted this phenomenon in the non-eurozone. There's still this, the, the poorer economies grow faster than the richer. But in the eurozone, we find after now, uh, well, 20 years of having uh, the euro, almost 20 years of having the euro, that the poor countries have lost income relative to the richer countries. And income gaps have opened up. And this is such a massive and striking phenomenon that you have to ask the question, well, is this a good currency for Europe? And should we not perhaps better start from scratch? Or at least find a way out of this currency for some of the countries which are most severely affected by this negative development? And that's the question that's being asked. And this is still not probably being discussed in Germany and still not probably being answered, answered anywhere in Europe. Well, to clarify what I meant by populist is there's a checklist that we can go through similar to an optimum currency area that it is anti-elitist, that it speaks on behalf of a constructed people, no matter if the people agree with it or not, that it oversimplifies, that it's against the separation of power, that it's anti-media, that it's anti-academia because you have your own truth. There's a long list of things that is not like the colloquial use of it. I totally agree that if a, popul if a populist mainstream politician tries to win an easy support, then he or she tells a simple story. Fair enough. This should be in a rhetorical way be fine, but they are enemies of the procedure of how we institutionalize our deliberative process in what we call a Western type democracy. And we have a number of very prominent examples of people who optimize such a strategy in Europe as well as in the United States. So it's not just an ivory tower kind of reflection of is everyone who works in the political sphere attracted by a populist form of rhetoric, but there's a clear distinction between those who play according to the rules of a pluralist system and those who are against. I would not completely agree to that. I mean, um, your definition of populism is a definition uh, that can be changed. Yeah, um, sure. You say populists are anti-elitists anti or something like that, right? That's an easy way, way for the elites to say that they can never be populist. But that's not true. Right? I mean, obviously, the allies can also be populist, so I would um, reject this part of the definition. You also say that the populists are against the separation of power. Well, if this is true, then the AFD is not populist. 
the, the AFD in, in all its um, uh, programmatic um, um, statements has very clearly uh, indicated that it uh, supports the separation of power and wants to have some power of the parliament relegated to a referenda, which sort of would uh, break up the legislative power of the parliaments into some power for the parliaments and some power to the people. That's more separation of power and not mm -hmm. less separation of power. Well, what I try to do is if you say everyone is populist and we come up with a relative relativist use of the term, then I have to clarify what I mean, and I did. And then we can, of course, discuss the different components, but there's something on the table that can be applied on different empirical tests. If we apply it on a test, it does not necessarily mean that everyone who could be described as populist meets all the points in the checklist. Like, as you said, if there's a certain separation of power component, fine, fair enough. It just helps to clarify who's doing what. But if we see general trends in countries like Hungary and Poland and Trump America and Erdogan and so on, the technique of doing this follows similar features. And these features can be clustered and defined according to a working definition like this. I don't want this to be the mother of all definitions. It's work in progress. It's a definition, as you say. But it is something that we can apply and then see in what case does it help to explain something and in what case we have to refine it and differentiate it more. What you said about what academic research could do to test the quality of the monetary union in terms of the distribution of income is an important contribution. This is fact-based, this is research, this is something that needs to be part of the discourse. The populist version would be, let's introduce the DMARC. And that is something that totally ignores that there are something like transaction costs. And in an ideal world where we can make wishes or ask the ferry, we could say, well, if we would only have this back, then the world would be a better place and we would be rid of a monetary union. In reality, we have it and we can reform it, but we cannot go back to something which according to textbooks would be perfect. This would be my point in the distinction. The one thing is absolutely important. We wouldn't improve anything without knowledge and knowledge is provided by those who search for the truth we in academia and the media. But if academia is discredited by, well, there are so many journals who publish false information and media is those who lie or are a propaganda tool, then there's not much left what a citizen can use to form an opinion in a system in which the whole project of democracy that we were discussing back and forth from an institutional or a procedural point of view is based on the assumption that a citizen can form an opinion. But if there is no source of information other than what politicians with an interest-driven motivation say, then good night democracy. It doesn't matter if we decide with qualified majority voting or with any other form because it would be useless anyway. Um, so. Um I like our discussion, but I also would like to uh, <laughs> include our audience so they also can participate. So if we have any questions from the audience, please. Um, I'll just put a disclaimer and say my point of engagement is highly theoretical. It's not to say the United States of Europe will happen, but it's sort of to give the out the areas that academic scholarship can look at in trying to contemplate on whether the idea of the United States of Europe will be a good idea or not. So my first question is, uh, beyond the idea of integration and the instruments of integration, uh, will it be a good idea from a theoretical level to also look at how an exit will be legitimized? And that brings me to my second question. Do you think it will be a good idea to also sort of just define what the sovereign character of the United States of Europe will be and what its demands will be on any entity that wants to break away? So and I'm talking about demands and talking about the burden of proof that will that the entity will have to present to justify that a breakaway is an appropriate remedy. <laughs> well, as I said, I'm, I'm not a defender of the United States of uh, Europe, and therefore I, I would like to um, um, refrain from uh, defining conditions under which a country might break away from a state of 
uh, Europe. I, I'm very strongly of the opinion that we should uh, remain a confederacy with the right uh, to um, withdraw from the confederacy. Um, this right has not been spelled out uh, with much precision in the European uh, treaties, as you um, know. Uh, it just um, says that if a country wishes to leave the, Europe, Euro uh, the, the, the European Union, then it should notify the Council. Um, what exactly this does mean that a country wishes to do something might have been, should have been spelled out with uh, greater uh, precision. Um, this is unfortunately, I would say, um, not so untypical for European law that they leave um, a certain degree of vagueness in um, uh, treaties and, and other acts of um, legislation. But even if we leave it like that and say a country wishes to do something, we could say, well, then it is in the responsibilities of the countries to define what exactly is necessary to say that a country wishes to do something. And here I think that the British referendum was clearly uh, misguided. Um, they just posed this one single question uh, to uh, the voters, do you wish to do you, do you wish the United uh, Kingdom to leave the European Union or do you want to stay? Without presenting the alternatives, right? And, and this gives now lots of headaches mm -hmm. to uh, Mrs. May and, and other politicians in uh, the United Kingdom because it is not clear that there is a majority in the United Kingdom for a hard Brexit and it is not clear that there is a majority in the United Kingdom for a soft Brexit. Both questions are completely undecided. Also, it is not clear whether it is actually legitimate to say that a country wishes something if this wish is documented just at one single point in time, but has consequences for future generations. Right? So a country might well spell out that a wish should have some kind of um, um, persistence, um, that it should be um, the same wish after a certain period of time another referendum 10 years later, and, and if then the British people are still of the opinion that they want just hard Brexit, um, then indeed uh, they, they will leave the European Union. However, I do see that this limits greatly the flexibility uh, and the sovereignty of the country to leave when it thinks that its interests are not uh, well maintained in the uh, European Union. So it's a hard problem um, to solve, and I can just give you some instantaneous thoughts on your question. I don't really... Um, pretend to have a definite solution to that. And I try to answer this without knowing your question already in my second point in my presentation, that European integration doesn't work according to a script. So the assumption <laughs> is we know this is what we want to go to, but since I see the project as a discourse-based one, it's man-made and it can also lead to something else. I'm also not a promoter of the United States of Europe even if we would more precisely define what exactly we mean by that. I also don't necessarily insist on a certain wording that it should never be a state or there is a gray zone between confederal and federal or whatever. So I understand the sensitivity with certain wording, but it exists already and countries might decide that they take the political costs of leaving, then they will find ways to do it, no matter if the treaty will be more or less precise. I also assume that there will be a lesson learned from Brexit and they will respond to the next treaty reform in which this is more in detail announced with all the implications that no one wants to go through again. Any other questions? about populism, but actually as the experience goes, the British voted for Brexit, for Brexit but then br leaders of Brexit left uh, the country. I mean, the majority of leaders the government. just refused to take part in the process of separation from the European Union. So isn't it just, you know, a kind of big manipulation? Because if you just now read the British press, the part of it seems to be unwilling to leave the EU. Another part of the country doesn't know how to leave the EU. 
So it is like a big game and nobody knows the result. So maybe it's, it's better not to, to stop at the moment and think before leaving. What do you think about that? Well, this is another big term to talk about manipulation. We had a philosophical reflection with our staff member in the back who believes that basically everything we do is manipulation, which in his case taking a photo is perfectly true, or us wearing a suit manipulates you because you think that people in suits don't lie, or whatever <laughs> you uh, adjust with the performance on stage. So either everything is a manipulation or we agree on a working definition, and then we could draw conclusions from it. The simple fact that someone campaigns and then wants his life back can be judged on a personal base, whether it says much about how legitimate the vote was or not. I'm not British, I'm indirectly affected because I'm invested there, but this doesn't qualify to tell them what they should do. But I think we mentioned already a number of things that need to be improved or at least to take into consideration in the future. It is a big mess, but it wouldn't be better if we would just tell them, listen guys, press the button and go back to where you started and discuss it again. I could personally or from a citizen's perspective sympathize with this, but I also see that a lot of people take it very, very seriously. Take Gisela Stewart, from the area of Birmingham, who was born in Bavaria and then made a career with the help of Mr. Stewart to become a famous politician from the Labour Party and is now the forerunner for Brexit to want to get control back and rule the waves in a concept that for me intellectually is hard to follow, that people in her constituency who come with a majority from Asia would go back to what once was Little England. This I simply cannot think, but she is so strongly motivated that this is her mission, as long as she's a politician, to push it through, that I cannot say I know better or she shouldn't do this, because it comes from deep within her political belief that this is something Britain must do. And I would always fight for people's right to say something which is not my opinion, because this is basically the idea of pluralism that we continue to repeat is the essence of what we stand here in our political system. Mr. Lecourt? Well, a few more remarks um, on what you said about the United um, Kingdom. I think actually the politics in the United Kingdom currently is a complete mess. Um, and that's the fault of the British people, right? <laughs> it's not our responsibility to put that um, in uh, order. You said the Brexiteers uh, left, and why don't they shape the process? I don't really find that a fair criticism because it's not quite true. I mean, the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom is a Brexiteer. At least after the referendum, she turned a Brexiteer, right? <laughs> Well, yeah, that's it, right? Sure. I mean, she said Brexit is Brexit, and she wants a Brexit, and, and there's no, apparently, no um, reflection on her side of trying to lead the U United Kingdom back into the European Union or, or prevent its exit, but she wants the Brexit, but she wants the Brexit in a certain way, and others wanted the Brexit in a different way, and, and in some way, I think it is quite consequential of them to say, well, her way is not our way, and, and we do not shape this way because we think it's a bad way. So they leave the government, and, and that's, that's fine with me. You also say, um, wouldn't it have been good to think about the whole issue before putting it to the people? Well, clearly, it, it would have been great had anybody spent some thought on that. But this is something which you should also um, criticize the British people with and the British media with. Because we knew since 2013 that David Cameron would initiate an, a, a referendum. Initially, he said in 2017, or at the latest in 2017, then it came in 2016. But there were three years' time to think about this issue, to debate this issue, to ask the prime minister questions. What exactly, what kind of reforms do you want to get from the European Union? What are your demands? 
uh, are there sensible demands? Would they be sufficient for us to stay in the, U in, in, in the European Union? <laughs> what kind of alternatives do you have in case the British people vote for an exit? Uh, how would the exit be shaped? What kind of status would the United Kingdom have? Soft Brexit, uh, hard Brexit, Northern Irish border, and, and all these kind of things, uh, issues. I don't actually know what happens to Gibraltar, yeah, right? These type of questions were apparently not discussed. Not in the British population, not in the media, not in politics. I mean, everybody was just talking about, well, we'll have a referendum. And they discussed the question of the referendum at some length. But no serious discussion about the future of the United Kingdom after the referendum, in both possible cases of an outcome of the referendum, were discussed at length in the United Kingdom, as far as I no. And this is why we have this mess now. And that's the fault of the British people not to buy newspapers which lead this kind of discussion, but rather read the sun or something like that. right? And it's the fault of the British people to have voted for a prime minister, Mrs. May, who has said she doesn't have a good concept for the Brexit, but he, she wants to lead Britain this way. right? She presented herself to the British people after the referendum. She, she had fresh elections. She was voted prime minister again, okay, at a narrow majority and with a coalition partner, but she was charged by the people to do it, and so is the responsibility of the people to see uh, what happens and whether this makes any sense or not. It's not our business. Right. Um, yes, please. <laughs> Well, you know, I mean, if you have a phenomenon and you ask the question, well, is this the reason or are there other phenomena you could also look at, then the, the honest answer will always be, of course, there are always other influences too, right? But you also have to try to identify which are major developments and when have certain things changed. What I pointed out was that the convergence of incomes we've had in the European Union prior to the introduction of the euro has been has has stopped and has actually reverted because now we have divergence in the European Union shortly after we introduced the euro so just looking at this correlation which is not necessary causality but looking at this correlation you may ask well is there something causal uh, to it and I would claim that there are some good arguments from economic theory why this is actually a causal uh, phenomenon and one I was alluding to in my uh, keynote speech. The problem is the following. The, the euro prevents states or regions from adjusting to competitive pressures by just revaluing their currency. Okay. So everybody is subject to the same competitive pressure everywhere in the single market which for an economist is actually something good because economists typically would say, well, what happens if we have this competitive pressure? Then all the uncompetitive enterprises which are distributed across the common market will, uh, run, will go, go out of business and the more productive ones remain. All the uncompetitive uh, enterprises, they will innovate and become more productive. Also fine, right? The problem that we have is that the unproductive enterprises are um, concentrated in, in, in certain areas. We have clusters of unproductivity in the European Union. And these clusters uh, are often <coughs> identical with countries or at least with huge parts of countries. And we have a severe problem for the finances of a government if a huge region in a country um, is um, not competitive anymore, has to lay off workers. Unemployment is rising. Um, uh, exports are falling. Um, there is a deficit on, on, on current account, right? All of this inhibits the government from financing the expenditures that it usually needs to finance because the economy in a big region of the country is in depression. 
Sometimes it's the whole country, more or less in Greece. Sometimes it's part of the country, as in Italy or in Spain. Right? And these clusters are the problem. If the unproductive enterprises were distributed equally across the European Union, we could perfectly well live with the competitive pressure of the euro. But since some countries are much more affected by the competitive pressure than others, we have a sizable problem in terms of political stability in those countries which are greatly affected from recession and depression and loss of income. And this is what I criticize. Uh, so, Mr. Bruckner, if you have any closing remarks so we can mm -hmm. uh, close our debate. Or closing remarks? Any opinions? Oh, yeah, sorry. Th th last question then. Okay. <laughs> because uh, we are a little bit, you know, out of schedule, but still. Okay, sure. <laughs> uh, my name is Degen. I'm also enrolled in the Cubist course. Um, I have a question on EU integration. Uh, this week we visited the Dutch embassy and we talked to the Dutch ambassador to uh, uh, to Germany. Um, and the Dutch and recalling from the conversation that we had, the, the Dutch we the Dutch ambassador said that. Um, the Netherlands is, uh, is is more of an EU uh, what's it called? A net a net contributor than a net receiver. Mm -hmm. The Dutch, um, uh, you know, the GDP per capita uh, contribute or, or is one of the states that contribute one of the states that contributes most to the EU. Um, why would the Dutch be comfortable in the position where they are, being uh, pro European Union? And um, uh, considering the, the cost that they incur to the economy, uh, they contri contribute to the EU, and the loss that they incur from the common agricultural policy, for example. Well, the, the answer to that is actually simple. Um, this balance of net contributor or net receiver mm -hmm. just applies to uh, payments between government entities, right? So the government of uh, the Netherlands pays a certain sum of money to the European Union, and the European Union pays a certain sum of money to typically agencies, government agencies, which redistribute this then among private agents in the, uh, in, in, in the Netherlands. But what is not taken into account um, is the benefit that the private sector takes from, say, the single market, right? from exporting their goods to other countries, from making profits, which they receive from the payments of customers in other countries. This is completely not taken into account in when, when you look at just the, the net balance of payments between uh, governments there. Therefore, this is actually an inappropriate measure of um, measuring the benefit the, 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 the membership in the European Union has for a particular country.